Welcome viewers to our ongoing program, Nuclear Free Future Conversation, coming to you remotely during this COVID time from the studios of Channel 17, Center for Media and Democracy, Town Meeting TV here in Burlington, Vermont. And the subject of our discussion today is Fukushima Daiichi, Japan, nuclear meltdowns at 10. And to discuss this, I have my return, my guests who thankfully have returned to our discussion, the Fairwinds Energy Education founders, Maggie Gunderson and Arne, Arne Gunderson and board member Chiho Kaneko, who uh, is returning also to our show from Fairwinds Energy Education. So thank you very much, all of you for, for coming back on the show after being away for a couple of years. Welcome back. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Margaret. So we, uh, first of all, we have, we post your website, www.fairwinds, F-A-I-R-E-W-I-N-D-S.org, so that we know all the, the enormous amount of work you've been doing for the past several years since you relocated to South Carolina, I believe for, for family reasons, right? So, and now we are commemorating in our way and, and Chiho, you're here, you're here also, Chiho Kaneko, the 10th year after the Fukushima Daiichi meltdowns. So uh, your, your work is ongoing and amazing to us. Uh, your, your dogged <laughs> uh, tenacity to this issue, which people want to forget. Vermont Yankee has closed and we're dealing with the uh, nuclear waste. However, you are dealing with the disaster in, in Fukushima. So, and con continuously along with all, all of the other subjects. So to open up, could you refer to the article that was that was titled, Japan Hasn't Recovered 10 Years After Fukushima Meltdowns. Okay. Yeah, we, we wrote that, um, you know, because of the 10th commemoration, everybody wants to forget Fukushima, uh, except the people that live there. Um, the uh, Japanese government wants to put it behind and focus on the Olympics, and uh, they call the Recovery Olympics, and they're anything but recovered. And the article that you referred to uh, discusses the fact that Japan has improved. Half of the radiation decayed away just naturally, and there has been cleanups in populated areas, but it hasn't recovered. What we're finding is radiation is blowing in from the mountains right back into the areas that have been previously cleaned. You know, if you think about the, the, the Green Mountains from, say, St. Albans down to Manchester, well, that's, the, um, that's about the size of the mountain ranges that run through Fukushima and uh, Fukushima Prefecture. And uh, can you imagine trying to clean that from St. Albans down to Manchester, clean every, uh, every nook and cranny of the Green Mountains? You can't. And that's the problem in Japan, that it will continually recontaminate for, for centuries. Yes, and Arnie, I've seen the pictures of the garbage bags, ordinary plastic garbage bags, and then what do they do with them? Well, they're they're far from ordinary. They weigh they they weigh a ton each, and they they throw the dirt into them and the contaminated soil. Um, in the in the areas that they've cleaned, um, they have over ten million bags, ten million tons of radioactive waste that. Uh, that, that needs to be disposed of. Um, what they're doing with it, unfortunately, is a lot of it is getting incinerated. And then the radioactivity is being put in concrete for public works projects all over Japan. So they're you know, making radioactive highways, radioactive uh, uh, buildings. Uh, when I was in Tokyo um, uh, a couple of years ago, I, I was in a parking lot and I, I think they're called bumpers, car bumpers, the concrete things you drive your wheels up against when you're in a parking lot. And I set my uh, Geiger counter down on top of it. It was highly radioactive. So they're, they're taking this radioactive waste, 
reducing the size of it, but not the radioactivity. Some of it blows out the stack and recontaminates Fukushima or comes across the Pacific and into uh, the Pacific Northwest. And the rest they take and add to concrete and spread out all over Japan. Um, it's the gift that keeps on giving. And who is the watchdog there in Japan? Because another point that you make in the article is that Northern Japan remains radiologically contaminated. It's actually contaminated. And who is, who is the watchdog there? They're, they're equivalent to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is something called the uh, METI. And they created another agency, the N NRA National something. And they are, I can't remember what it's for, but they have two oversight agencies, but they've been captured by the nuclear industry. Right after Fukushima, um, I, I got to talk to Naoto Khan, who was the uh, prime minister of Japan and um, during the meltdowns. And um, uh, so remember the name Medi, and of course, TEPCO is the owner. And I was talking about his decision when to evacuate and he was facing evacuating 30 million people in Tokyo. And, and we were talking about the information he was getting. And he said, uh, Arnie, the information I received from TEPCO and Medi, his own government, was neither accurate nor timely. So his own government was telling the, the top guy in government the wrong information and they weren't giving it to him in a timely fashion. You know, that's, Around the world, we see that though. The, the regulators have been captured by the industry that uh, is supposed to be protecting us. So they are serving the industry instead of the people, the victims. So, right. And what about the, your third point in the article? Previously cleaned areas are becoming radiologically contaminated again. You, you did describe something of that right now. Yeah, we found, we were, I was in a town called Minami Soma, which was evacuated after the meltdowns and uh, um, remained empty for a couple of years. And, uh, it's a large town and uh, TEPCO cleaned it up. And I was on the uh, roof of the town hall, it's a four story building, and it had been epoxy. They had cleaned the roof, put a beautiful epoxy finish on it, put solar collectors on it. And I, I climbed underneath the solar collector and found this little pile of dust and took a sample and it was highly radioactive. The only way that could happen is if it was blowing back in from the mountain ranges. And you know, the kids are riding their bicycles through this stuff. Uh, we're finding it in shoelaces. Um, so it's, it's not a problem that's solvable. Uh, although Japan would like to have the people believe that these particles, these micro particles that we're finding that are highly radioactive are inconsequential. In fact, they get in your lungs, they get in your liver, they get in your GI tract. And in the long term, they're quite cancerous. And meanwhile, we're running, we're coming up to the Olympics. And your fourth point in the article is the Olympic venues in Fukushima prefecture are more contaminated than in Tokyo Olympic venues. So yeah, we, um, there's a place called the J Village, which is the, the national soccer camp for all of Japan. And um, we found radioactivity there, so has Greenpeace. Uh, we found radioactive plutonium in the soil there, which of course is one of the most lethal elements known to man. So what, what's happening is most of the Olympics will be done in Tokyo. And at the Tokyo Olympic venues, they're relatively clean. At other places in Tokyo, they're not. So the best place to sleep is on the track. Um, but the, the, so Tokyo's Olympic venues are relatively clean, but they also want to showcase that Fukushima has been cleaned and it hasn't been. So, you know, just by the samples we took at the J camp uh, is just that one last indication that uh, um, this problem's not going to go away and Japan has not recovered. Yeah. Maggie, you are in the forefront of, of uh, the, uh, not, not of uh, being on guard against the misinformation that we're receiving. Like here in Vermont, we can breathe a sigh of relief. We say 
Vermont Yankee is gone, but we're dealing with a, a, a propagation of nuclear power plants around the world, even, even as some are closing and through the efforts of people like you. And, but uh, what, what about the, uh, what do you see today happening? I see a couple of things too. Let's talk about Vermont because that's where, um, you know, we're from and, and, and you and Chiho both live. Um, we still have concerns about Vermont Yankee. Um, Arnie testified, Fairwind submitted testimony uh, um, to the um, Public Service Board to show that there's micro particles of radiation that can migrate. And we talked about this, and that's what all of our scientific work over the last few years have been has been about. And we published another paper um, in November, so peer-reviewed journal article that that shows this occurs, and this is based that particular article that Arnie, um, Dr. Marco Kalthofen of WPI, and I all did together shows that. Um, radioactivity, radioactive microparticles blow in the wind and, and they recontaminate, just like Arnie's talking to you. And those measurements were done at Olympic sites for this, this peer reviewed paper. And in that, when we look at decommissioning Vermont Yankee, for example, we tried to get that put in, that the, there were, had to be certain monitoring standards, but it was not put in. And so they're allowed to uh, do a technique called rubbleization. They take some of the concrete and they can grind it up. Like when you see a highway ground up and, and then new tarmac put down, well, they can take this old concrete at the site, but they, they, there's no methodology for oversight. There's no um, methodology for exactly how to measure if that concrete is contaminated. And when they rubbleize it, it's not in an um, enclosed, protected um, unit, uh, whether that's tenting or um, you know the, uh, a building itself. They're not doing that. So that literally that radioactivity, if any of it is ground in, and we believe that it will be, and we can prove that. Uh, is going to be blowing in the wind. It's going to end up in the water we, that you drink in Vermont, the, the food you eat, and people are going to breathe it in, anyone who lives near there. And there is a school right next to the site. So this is this is a major concern for Vermonters as it is for the work that Chiho and Arnie and I do. And the work that we do, um, the community volunteer citizen science that gives us the science to do what we're doing, um, Chiho has, has worked with us on that. We couldn't do the work we're doing if it wasn't all of us doing this together and being a community and, and working together. Chiho did some of the key translations with Naoto, Prime, former Prime Minister Naoto Khan. And, and um, it just, she was there in person doing live translation. Yeah, Chiho, Chi could you come in on this? And, and I, I understand that there was a wonderful video that I just watched. Uh, called, um, well, it was with Mary Olson, uh, Humanity Rising. And it was such a wonderful, wonderful presentation of, of the Fukushima disaster. And uh, Chiho, could you come in and, and tell us your, something of your experience? Because I, I understand that you went to Japan only 10 days after March 11th, 2011. Um, so I primarily went home to my, my home, which is Iwate Prefecture, which is um, 150 miles north of Fukushima Daiichi, uh, you know, reactors. And it was, it was not an easy journey at the time, you know, because uh, of the, obviously, infrastructure was completely in shambles, you know, train was not running, etc. But I made it, uh, it within Japan, I made it. Anyway, um, it's it's hard to um, and to, uh, capture the what last ten years been since that time because um, it's it's been a series of um, disbelief and disappointment or maybe outrage you might say that you thought that the uh, you know because what I was witnessing all those you know years is that the uh, yes there is definitely we are uh, affected by. The fallout radiation, even as far, even farther as you know, uh, my home hometown of Morioka, which is 150 miles from uh, the you know, reactors, 
And, and yet people don't talk about it or more importantly, the government and the nuclear industry, they poured so much efforts, campaign, PR and money into um, helping people, coercing people to um, accept that yes, it's going to be all right. Yes, this is all right. This we can go back to the contaminated area for those people, you know, who uh, evacuated from Fukushima towns and villages. It's okay. It's going to be okay. Why is it like that? Because the international nuclear industry set up offices along the um, you know coast of Fukushima. Now uh, IAEA has a huge office uh, in, in in a town called uh, I think uh, Tamuramachi, and. Um, they are studying the effects of radiation it, studying, but also it's a huge uh, framing uh, propaganda, I, I think some regional people say it, uh, device to in a way um, force people to accept the reality of contaminate, nuclear contaminated world. It's not just about Japan. I think it's a global concern. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I went off tangent, but this no, is oh, no, no. my mind. <laughs> you know, but, but what is the IA, you, you just use the- uh, Oh the yeah, Air International Atomic Energy Agency. Yeah, so it's a basically nuclear, pro-nuclear regulatory uh, agency of the world. Um, and it's, it's um, I don't know if it's a UN, United Nations uh, agency, Mag, you can talk about that. It is a United Nations chartered yeah. agency, but in its charter, it's to monitor and regulate and promote nuclear energy. So to say that they're not working to an end to make us all think that everything's okay is just a lie. Mm -hmm. It's but uh, also, sorry to interrupt, but yeah. UN, uh, I don't, I can never pronounce it, uh, UN, uh, what's the scientific committee on the effects of atomic radiation, right? Uh, that's also, that's the United Nations agency. They just um, came up with the uh, 2020 report last year, I guess. And uh, they basically preempted uh, all the, uh, possible health effects that might come from Fukushima fallouts by saying that, quote, in the years since 2013 report, no adverse health effects among Fukushima prefecture residents have been documented. Um, they concluded it already. And so there is no recourse for the, uh, not just the residents of Fukushima, but elsewhere in Japan, you know, if they're sick. Well, international authority says there is no uh, negative effects. So what if you get sick, you cannot blame anybody. So it is outrageous. I think, I think a lot of people feel outraged in Japan. And yet, this is also the hard part for me to swallow because people, um, Basically, it's a Japanese society, the nature of the society, perhaps, but people who voice dissenting opinions are marginalized. It's easier for Japanese society to do that way. So there's kind of insidious um, uh, shutting down of dissent, dissenting voices happening on one hand that goes hand in hand with all this huge campaign. And I'm just really, Heart, disheartened to see witness all this. I stop now. <laughs> well, no, the thing is, the thing is, Chiho, you don't stop, and and that is why uh, we admire you, and we're so so fortunate to have you uh, on this program now, and and our viewers know that Fairwinds Energy uh, Education has been on this nuclear free show for for over 10 years and uh, we appreciate so much your input and you're waking us up about the issue and the ongoing issue. And Maggie, would you come back and, and comment on your on the, the 
community volunteer project and citizen science that is ongoing. Is it is it all over the world or is it just in the United States? No, it started um, in Japan and um, we work in conjunction with Dr. Marco Kaltofen at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, which is called w WPI now. And um, it's it started in Japan. We've done work since Fukushima there. Then we also started about a year after that um, in UK. And we worked in UK around Sellafield nu uh, nuclear facility and waste area that has leaked into the Irish Sea. Um, and then we have numerous sites um, through Fairwinds Energy Education and separately, Dr. Mar Marco Kaltopin has sites that he's continued testing at um, like the Hanford Waste Storage in Washington State, which uh, he works with Hanford Challenge to uh, protect and defend the local population there from all the waste, federal waste repository that's leaking everywhere and impacting the environment. So what Chiho is talking about happening in, happening in Fukushima happens here in the United States too. It's happening in the UK. It's happening in other countries who I, I know from Dr. Helen Caldercott and some of her work and her colleagues that it's happened also in France. And, uh, you know, it's all these areas and people attest to, and I could name many other locations. It's a worldwide problem where governments want to keep um, weapons. They want to show might is right. And nuclear power feeds into the weapons cycle. And Arnie can explain the, the science on that, but they, the two go hand in hand. And we didn't know that when Arnie and I got involved in the nuclear industry, each of us separately, we met in the industry. We thought we, we were both trained with the Atoms for Peace program and, and taught the Atoms for Peace program. So we thought we were doing something that was anti-war and anti-bomb. We were both horrified about what had happened with the atomic bomb being dropped on Japan and, and, and done as a target to show the world it wasn't even, it wasn't needed. You know, those, those papers were released, I think 20 years ago that proved that out of, you know, from World War uh, II papers. And uh, I just feel very strongly that we continue this work and we show that the nuclear industry and the weapons industry go together. Right. And, and Arnie, the, the uh... The fact is that today, the nuclear power industry is reviving itself as we see on your, your uh, smokescreen um, video that we'll show at some point during this, this program. But uh, how is it that they can get away with, with saying that, that uh, nuclear power is a green industry and that it's needed now? <clears throat> That's a great question. You know, when I'm out talking, um, people will say, what are you going to do without it? And I'll, I'll present alternatives like you know, wind, solar batteries. And, uh, uh, and people will say, yes, but we need a big boy toy, the nuclear power reactors. Um, they'll also claim that uh, we need nuclear for CO2. You know, I built these plants 50 years ago and nobody was talking about CO2. They weren't built for CO2 reduction ever. So they're hiding behind what we call a CO2 smoke screen and the, the video addresses that. What, what the video shows is that the, um, the IAEA and um, another group called uh, WANO, World Association yeah. of Nuclear Operators, um, says that uh, to, to mitigate global warming, we need a thousand nuclear plants in the, uh, in the next 30 years. So that's about one nuke every 10 days has to be has, has to come online. Um, if you do the math, and uh, we do in the, in the smoke screen video, um, it shows that um, uh, it would cost $8 trillion and it would only reduce car carbon dioxide by 6%. So building new nukes doesn't solve the problem. One, it takes 30 years to, to even make a little dent in the problem compared to if you can put a windmill up in a year. Uh, and um, uh, secondly, it's extraordinarily expensive. So money that would be better spent on wind and solar and batteries is getting funneled into a more expensive. Why? It's because of lobbyists on Congress. Um, the, 
well-financed lobbyists have the ear of a lot of congressmen. Thank God they don't have Bernie's ear, but uh, a, a lot of uh, congressmen believe what the lobbyists in the nuclear uh, industry are doing. And you could show that film to your viewers now, Margaret. Okay, we'll do that. In 2015, human activity released 35,810 million tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. In order to avoid catastrophic climate change, this number must quickly be reduced. Currently, our CO2 production grows by 2% every year as people worldwide seek a more affluent lifestyle. The World Nuclear Association, or WNA, has a plan to solve this problem building 1,000 new nuclear reactors before the year 2050. That means we would need to build a nuclear reactor every 12 days for the next 33 years. Our existing reactors offset only 3% of global emissions. Every time a new reactor goes online, our carbon footprint goes down slightly, and only by this much. Along the way, outdated reactors must be decommissioned, the deadly waste must be tended in perpetuity, and each new reactor built will increase the probability of atomic disaster somewhere in the world. Constructing this infrastructure will cost $8.2 trillion. Even after spending all this money and waiting all this time, by the year 2050, these new nuclear reactors will have offset only 3.9 gigatons of CO2, which is less than 10% of the reduction that we need. The nuclear industry touts CO2 reduction to greenwash its agenda. For the nuclear industry, 8.2 trillion is good business. For humanity, it is an opportunity cost. Precious time and money wasted on the wrong thing. If we follow the WNA, another generation will pass and climate change will only get worse. We already have clean, cheap, and timely ways to reduce CO2 emissions, and nuclear power is not one of them. The nuclear solution to climate change is a smokescreen. We don't deny science. Help us protect the water you drink, the food you eat, and the air you breathe. Radiation knows no borders. Now, what uh, when we we've seen the video and what is that main organization, the nuclear organization that is is named there? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with it. Uh, it was WANO, uh, W-A-N-O. It's the World Association of uh, Nuclear Operators. Here in the United States, we have uh, uh, NEI, Nuclear Energy Institute, and they've got a seventy million dollar a year budget. Um, to lobby Congress. And of course, you know, your local utilities around the country have uh, similar budgets. And above that NEI is this WANO, which, uh, which covers the world. Um, uh, we use their numbers and we use uh, Lazard, which is an investment bank, and uh, who is, they don't have a dog in this fight, um, and, um, and showed that uh, one, you're only going to make a five, six percent reduction uh, if you spend eight trillion dollars on on a thousand nukes. And then there's the risk. You know, we all we've seen Chernobyl. We've seen three reactors melt down at Fukushima. In in my career, that's better than a meltdown every ten years. Uh, is that a risk you're we're willing to take? And my answer is no, for two reasons. One is what's happening in Fukushima. Uh, that there's a public health risk. The second thing is there's money to be spent and there's a limited amount of money. It's best spent on the least expensive option that gets us the most electricity. And, that, and that's not so. That's and not protects people the most. Yeah. Because yeah. the nuclear industry, and this is what she has talking about in, in part of her work, the nuclear industry makes a decision that X number of lives are disposable based upon the risk of nuclear power. And that's a given. Um, you're not gonna see a windmill melt down. You're not gonna see solar collectors melt down and, and contaminate entire swaths of states and countries. You know, that's not gonna happen. Um, what was the comment that Prime Minister Khan made to you about you know, almost losing Japan? 
Um, yeah, I, I can't remember it exactly, but uh, Naoto Khan said to me and to the world, and also Gorbachev said, um, that the, this is a technology that can destroy the fabric of society overnight. Um, Gorbachev blames the collapse of the Soviet Union on, uh, uh, on Chernobyl, not on perestroika. And, and um, you know, Khan uh, clearly is of the same. He faced the destruction of his country um, uh, probably within 12 hours if, if uh, he didn't step in and force TEPCO to do the right thing. So this is not a technology that's very forgiving. Uh, when it goes wrong, it can destroy a country or you know, even many countries, uh, Europe for instance, uh, where there's luckily Fukushima, the wind was blowing out to sea 80% of the time. But in, in Europe, these reactors are surrounded by people in other countries. So we're dealing with a technology that can destroy the fabric of society overnight. Okay, on, on that note, I thank you for returning to this program. And I ask you to, to return again. And this, it's one of the benefits of, of the pandemic year, which do, the, the World Health Organization declared the pandemic on the same date as the, as the anniversary of, of uh, Fukushima disaster. So March, March 11th, to 2020, and here we are just past March 11th, 2021. So thank you, uh, Arnie, and thank you, Maggie Gunderson, and thank you, Chiho Kaneko, so much for returning to our program. And, and please, uh, we admire your work so much, and we need you, we need you, and our viewers need you, and you, you keep us awake, because it's so easy, and especially during the pandemic, to uh, to fall asleep about this. So, thank you thank for you. hosting us, Margaret, so much, yeah. and thank you for doing this work because you bring a whole coalition, both in Vermont and and na nationally and internationally, to to your viewers, and it's really appreciated. Yeah, and and thank you. Well, it's I I can't describe how much I admire your work, and Chiho, I just remembered. The the some uh, so, some poetry from Paul Ceylon, the Holocaust poet, about your witness, and I'll just go off with that. Deep in time's abyss, amid the al alveolar ice, dwells a sliver of truth. Your irreversible witness, mm -hmm. irreversible witness. That's what all of you are doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye for now. Thank you, viewers. Channel 17, Center for Media and Democracy.